Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for staying on and thank you for those who have just joined us. So for this afternoon, we have another session by our EGs, which will be represented by Dr. Avas Satesh Patel. He will be sharing uh, regarding our MSc Petroleum Engineering here at Harawat University. So without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Erval to start his presentation. So thank you, Alham, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So as Alham mentioned, I want to talk to you today about the Petroleum Engineering Program, uh, but in the context of sustainable development, which is increasingly becoming important to the oil and gas industry as we move towards cleaner, low carbon fuel sources to provide our uh, energy needs. So the petroleum industry has a critical role to play in achieving true uh, global sustainability at the macro and micro scale. But what do we mean by sustainable development? The term is actually a relatively recent concept. It's, it is defined as development that meets meets the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Now, this definition can be thought of as a framework that acknowledges the interconnectivity of three domains, the uh, society domain, the economic development domain, and the environmental domain. And only when these three domains intersect do we have true sustainable development. That is to say that we have a fairer world a viable world and a livable world. And we can use this framework when managing and exploiting resources in a way that is conducive to long term wealth generation and human well being and environmental well being. And since energy and energy fuels like oil and gas are an important source of wealth creation and human well being, but does also have an impact on the environment, we can use this. Uh, uh, sustainable development concept in the context of the oil and gas industry. So the current population of the world is around about 7.7 .7 million, sorry, 7.7 .7 billion. And this number is projected to increase to around about 10 billion by 2050. So at this current rate of increase, it's estimated that we will require around about 50% more energy uh, to sustain society. So we require more energy to light up our homes, provide transport, clean water, food, and we will require energy to contribute to health and general well-being. And the amount of energy available is fundamental to economic activity. And the bottom diagram uh, on this slide shows uh, the GDP or wealth production per capita and the amount of energy consumed by different countries. The higher income countries have used more energy to get rich. And if they are not able to maintain high energy consumptions, uh, the, the graph at the top suggests that they are likely to get poorer, sicker and less educated. So along the uh, human development index, they would uh, be lower down. So if we follow the trend in the top diagram, then countries like Mexico, China, South Africa, India, which have very large populations, will require more energy to improve their human development index. So we have a rising world population who want to get richer, be well educated and have a high standard of living. So these are some of the main factors driving the global energy demand. And this demand is largely from emerging economies. For example, the USA has about 4% of the world's population, but uses 24% of the world's energy, whilst India, an emerging economy, has 17% of the world's population, but uses only 5% of the world's energy. So as India seeks to, do, to develop, it will require more and more energy. And the graph on the left succinctly summarizes the general trends prosperity of a country or the world is intimately linked to its energy consumption. So the question now becomes, where does the extra energy come from? Remember, we need more energy, around about 50% more energy by 2050. Well, we could use the current energy we have, but more efficiently. This is called energy intensity. 
the lower the energy intensity, the more efficiently we are at converting it into wealth and prosperity. And the figure on the right shows how uh, energy intensity has decreased with different uh, uh, with time with different regions. And this has you know, substantially offset the global energy demand. Uh, in fact, we only need 30% more energy if demand for energy is offset by this increase in the energy efficiency. Alternatively, we use less energy. However, as we saw, this can have a negative impact on GDP and the Human Development Index. But let's assume for, for one second uh, or one minute that we try to, uh, to reduce our energy usage. Now, this has the positive effect of, of reducing CO2 emissions from, uh, from carbon emissions. And also, uh, we will be saving money. Not sure about uh, you know anyone uh, in this um, in this meeting, but um, certainly I've saved some money during the current COVID crisis because I've been using less energy. Uh, also, uh, in the UK, uh, there was a recent article on how a positive impact uh, of the coronavirus uh, uh, pandemic was that the private or personal um, debt level of the population as a whole decrease. So using less energy does have some positive impacts in this case, saving money. However, what do we do with this money that we've saved up? Well, eventually we're going to spend it. We'll spend it on goods, which will require huge, huge amounts of energy to produce and transport. And when you know the time is right, we will be spending on holidays, whether it's local or foreign. We will all be also be spending money on, on heating or AC for shops, for homes, uh, and lots of other, uh, uh, other things as well. So when we take all of this into consideration, the increase in energy from the extra spending power matches the energy we thought we had saved by just reducing our energy consumption. So the amount of energy is used just in different places and in different manners. So maybe saving or, or using less energy is not the sole, um, sole solution. So alternatively, we can transition to and rely on lower carbon energy, such as renewable energies like solar, wind or hydroelectric to meet our energy needs. Renewable energies as a whole is the fastest growing source of energy and it is predicted to account for around about 14% of the energy mix by 2040. And the UK is one of the countries leading this transition. Uh, it has the world's largest offshore wind farm and along with other sources of renewable energy, uh, renewable energy as a whole accounts for 37% of the UK's energy needs. And between April and June of 2020 uh, in the UK, none of its energy came from coal powered power plants, which contribute significantly towards CO2 emissions. So is renewable energy the way forward? Is renewable energy the answer to our energy, uh, energy needs? Well, this diagram clearly shows that the use of reno renewable energy is likely to increase by 2040. Uh, by 2040, it is predicted to account for around about uh, uh, 14 to 20% of all energy needs. Um, the primary fuel to meet energy demands in the future, however, will continue to be oil, gas and coal. So by 2040, fossil fuels is still projected to account for 8% of the fuel mix. Furthermore, the demand for petroleum, especially for liquid fuel, will also come from transport. So the figure on the right uh, shows that oil in particular will continue to dominate the transport sector until at least 2040, where it starts to plateau off. And maybe beyond that, depending on the efficiency of electric vehicles. Uh, within the transport uh, uh, realm, non-road vehicles such as planes and trains, as well as trucks, account for the major growth 
um, in the use of oil and not cars or motorbikes. But what happens after 2040? So we see that yeah, up until 2040, we have an increase uh, in the usage of oil for transport. After that, it's going to decline, or maybe even before that, it's going to decline. So if electric vehicles do replace the need for oil in transport, even in, let's say, uh, planes and in trains, the, the need for petroleum, oil and gas, will then come from other industry in the in the form of feedstock so in the form uh going to industry such as the construction industry uh such as in uh, in in power as well as in other industries as well like manufacturing industries so just to kind of wake you wake you all up i know it's quite uh, um, uh late in the day just a quick quiz and you can probably type your answer uh, out of these four products, which product do you can do you think contains petroleum? Is it do you think shampoo, lipstick, uh, computers, fertilizers, or do you think all of the above? So I'll just give you maybe uh, uh, thirty seconds or so to put type in an answer uh, into the chat. Number five, so one person says number five. Anyone else? Yeah, so yeah, it is, uh, it is number five. Shampoo, lipstick, computers, fertilizers, all of these products and more contain uh, petroleum uh, products in it. And what is worse than the like the peak oil denier? So people that reject that the idea that oil has reached its peak. What's worse than those people are, in my opinion, those that pretend that oil isn't really important to our society. They declare that technology will solve the day, when in reality, technology cannot function without oil. So without plentiful, cheap oil, our technologically driven civilization in uh, in the end will come to a crash. So just because we stop using oil for transport and energy generation doesn't mean that we will stop using oil and gas completely. So this is just a partial list of products that require petroleum to be produced. And in America alone, uh, people consume around about three and a half gallons of oil and more than 250 cubic feet of natural gas each day. And that's just America, uh, which accounts for 4% of the world's population. So petroleums, uh, petroleum products or hydrocarbons uh, in general are an extremely useful and versatile material. It's present in pretty much every product in your household. <clears throat> and the worst thing that we ever did to it was to actually burn it, which you know, obviously increases greenhouse gases and that then leads to uh, climate change. So that's the worst thing that we've ever did. But in, in fact, it is a really, really useful product. In fact, uh, as some of you may have seen over the weekend that there was this vaccination drive with the AstraZeneca. And as you can see over here, petroleum products are present in some medication. Now, I'm not saying that the COVID vaccines have petroleum in it, uh, but somewhere along the manufacturing line, whether it is within the vaccines or in the needles or the syringes, uh, there will be some petroleum product in it. So it's, it is ubiquitous. So we expect the use of petroleum to increase over the next 20 to 30 years for energy, transport and other industries as feedstock. So where does this petroleum come from? And is it not running out? So these charts show the elements of the industry that will be driving this growth. Petroleum is a finite natural resource. There will be a time when we will be running low on petroleum. However, for now, we expect some of this uh, uh, resource to come from new discoveries. So here in red, in, in the chart on the top left, but significant amount will 
uh, will come from existing discoveries and new technologies. Other sources of petroleum will also come from unconventional uh, resources like shale gas, shale oils, as well as condensates, uh, which, as you see in the bottom few diagrams, have increased significantly over, uh, over time in the, in the black line over here. So the demand for oil will continue to grow. When this demand will peak is, however, another matter. And it is sensitive to a number of factors, including GDP growth and road vehicle efficiencies. If the global GDP growth rate is, is higher, then peak oil will come around 2050 or so. Or earlier, if the global GDP is lower as we exit from, uh, from this um, COVID-19 pandemic. Likewise, if road vehicle efficiency uh, uh, improves significantly, then peak oil will be uh, earlier rather than later. So going back to the concept of sustainable development, the petroleum industry has an important role to play in achieving sustainable development. We require plentiful and economic supply of energy for social and economic domains of the, uh, of the sustainable development. However, using fossil fuel is likely to have an impact on the environment. Therefore, the petroleum industry also has an important role to play in managing and operating safely and also reducing emissions until at least an alternative energy source becomes economically uh, viable and widespread. So the term sustainable development in the petroleum industry does not mean continuing or maintaining production of oil and gas, but rather about meeting the needs of society at a reasonable cost and safely. And this demand for oil will obviously influence its value. Currently, due to the coronavirus, oil prices have taken a significant, uh, significant hit due to low, lower demands and uh, high, uh, sorry, due to lower demands and continued production of oil and gas by the oil majors. But due to the low, uh, due to the lockdown, no one is actually using it. So that's generally dr driven down the uh, oil and gas prices. <clears throat> Currently, the oil price is hovering around about 60 to 70 dollars uh, mark. And this, this uh, price is likely to increase as countries come out of lockdown as the vaccination drive uh, picks up globally. For example, the USA, uh, UAE, UK and Israel are just some countries where the lockdowns are being lifted and we are already seeing a sharp increase in economic activities in these countries. Uh, in the UK, uh, the, uh, the Bank of England has forecasted that the economy will uh, rebound at its fastest rate since World War II. So as uh, more and more economies uh, come out of lockdown, the demand for oil will increase. This will naturally drive up oil prices. And this figure shows how the oil prices are, has affected students enrolling onto petroleum engineering programs at universities globally. So it closely tracks the oil price. So you can see the oil price here in, in the red line and the bar chart below shows the number of students enrolling onto various uh, programs globally. It peaked in 2016, then declined as prices dropped in response to essentially a price war between Saudi Arabia and American producers. Now, this is part of the industry. Every 10 years or so, uh, we have oil prices rolling up and down due to supply and demand. After all, we are dealing with a natural material and supply and demand is influenced by the needs of society. And this is no different to, to other industries. Prices of whatever commodity will go up and down depending on supply and demand. But in the long term, the downward trend in student recruitment in the oil and gas industry is causing a skills shortage uh, due to people retiring, uh, people also opting not to enroll onto the oil and gas and into the oil and gas industry programs because uh, of 
uh, negative connotations associated with it. And this natu naturally has created a, a skills shortage. So as the current generation of petroleum engineers retire, the industry does need graduates to replace them. And due to the increased energy demands, employment of petroleum engineers is projected to grow by 3% uh, from 2019 to 2028 in America alone. So why should someone join the industry? Well, the petroleum industry offers um, a number of attractive compensation packages. So compared to other engineering disciplines, petroleum engineers can earn up to, uh, for example, in the in the USA, up, uh, earn up to 80,000 as graduates, and their median salary can go up to as high as around about 140,000. Now this is 15% higher than the next highest engineering discipline, which is chemical engineers. Also, Petroleum engineering is intellectually uh, uh, and physically challenging industry to work in. So that's another motivation for students to, to take up a, a petroleum engineering graduate uh, degree. <clears throat> um, this slide also shows why someone should uh, enroll onto a petroleum engineering program. Uh, three words are sufficient to summarize it, uh, technology, sustainability and mobility. So along with the attractive compensation packages, the industry is intellectually challenging and technology driven. You'll be working as part of a multidisciplinary team and be part of a global solution to meet the world's energy needs. And it also allows you to travel to some exotic places and not so exotic places like oil rigs, but at least you're out, uh, out of the office. Even during the pandemic, there are people traveling to rigs, traveling to the fields uh, um, to, uh, uh, to look for hydrocarbons. So if you do decide to become part of the petroleum industry and um, uh, study for a petroleum engineering uh, degree, you will primarily work in the upstream and midstream uh, industry. So the upstream industry finds and produces oil and gas, while the midstream industry processes, stores, markets and transports crude oil, natural gas and natural gas liquids. If you have a strong chemical engineering background as well on top of as well as your petroleum engineering background, you can also work in the downstream industry, which includes the oil refineries, the petrochemical plants, uh, retail outlets, natural gas distribution companies, and so on. So once you are a petroleum engineer and working either in the upstream and midstream industries, you have a, a variety of career options. You can work as a drilling engineer, uh, you know, which, uh, which are people that determine the best way to drill oil and gas wells, take into account a number of factors, including costs. Or you could be a completion engineer uh, where these people uh, decide the best way to finish building wells so that oil and gas will flow up uh, up from uh, underground reservoirs. Or you could become uh, reservoir engineers. Uh, these are engineers that estimate how much oil and gas can be recovered from underground reservoirs. Um, they also study the characteristics of the, of the reservoir, the fluids, uh, and, and determine the best methods which uh, to extract the, uh, uh, the oil uh, and gas from uh, the subsurface reservoirs. So what do you require to become a petroleum engineer? Well, you will have to develop a broad knowledge base and skill sets. You will combine mechanical and energy engineering with geoscience. You will deepen your knowledge in drilling, production and reservoir engineering, as well as venture into petroleum economics and business development strategy. So the petroleum engineering program that we offer at Harry Watt University provides an interdisciplinary approach to exploration and extraction of, uh, of petroleum resources. And it encompasses a wide range of petroleum engineering fundamentals, which will lead to the development of a highly skilled specialist 
with sound knowledge to tackle technical and environmental challenges that the industry currently faces. But that's not the end of the story. Uh, with the knowledge and the skills that you gain on the petroleum engineering program, you can also work in other sectors of uh, uh, other energy sectors as well, including geothermal energy, as well as carbon capture and storage. Because many of these sectors require the same sort of skill sets, for example, drilling engineers or reservoir uh, engineers as the petroleum industry. So you are also future proofing your career uh, as the petroleum industry experiences a transition uh, uh, in, uh, in, in energy. So here we have some additional requirements. Chief amongst them is a strong scientific knowledge and an accredited engineering degree. You will also need a passion for science and technology and a desire for lifelong learning um, that meets the needs of the industry as it evolves. And so this is where Harriet Watt University can help you. Harriet Watt University is a world-renowned university with a rich heritage as a leading research-led university, particularly in petroleum engineering. We are one of the premier universities providing fresh petroleum engineering graduates to the upstream oil and gas industry in the North Sea. And since 2014, uh, we have offered the same degree here in Malaysia. And the petroleum engineering program at Harry Watt University is offered by the Institute of Geoenergy Engineering. This is a well-leading institute for research and teaching in subsurface energy, encompassing not only oil and gas, but also carbon capture and storage, geothermal energy, and renewable energy. Currently, IGE is ranked ninth in the world and third in the UK for petroleum engineering. So we are a truly uh, uh, well-renowned institute for petroleum engineering. And if you are interested in completing a, a uh, postgraduate degree in petroleum engineering, the degree offered by IGE in Malaysia uh, is either a one-year full-time degree or a two-year part-time degree. The two-year part-time option is meant for anyone who is working full-time in the industry and cannot attend weekday classes. Uh, and so for those students, or for these students, sorry, uh, you will be attending classes during the weekends. And this program is tailored for any student who wishes to pursue a career in the upstream oil and gas industry, as I mentioned. And it consists of core taught modules that are fundamental to the industry from reservoir engineering, drilling engineering, production and economics. And you will also uh, undertake uh, group design projects and independent research projects where you will put to use some of the knowledge that you've gained in the, in the eight taught courses. The taught courses will primarily consist of a series of lectures, tutorials, lab work, uh, as well as uh, uh, field and site visits. Uh, both of these options, the one-year and uh, two-year uh, options, are uh, offering intakes in September and also from 2022, we will be taking intakes in uh, January as well. And we are a fully accredited programme uh, by both the Malaysian and UK authorities. And once on the program, you will also benefit from excellent links with industry and research activities by, uh, by staff at IGE. Many of our graduates will also go on to work for uh, many of the companies listed on this slide, and they in turn come back to Harry Watt as guest lecturers, consultants, uh, also examiners on some of our projects, uh, and also deliver workshops. So if you have any questions or want to know more about the programme, then please do, in, do get in contact either uh, with myself or with the uh, marketing team. I'm not sure if these this link is still active, but uh, they are available from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday to Fridays. 
Right, I think that's about it uh, for my talk. Do we have any questions? Hi everyone, should you have any questions, feel free to either text it in the chat box or you can also switch on your microphone and ask the question directly to Elva. So no questions? No one? <laughs> okay. If, if there's no questions, so thank you all for attending the session, uh, the last session of the day. So if you have further inquiries, feel free to contact any one of our education counsellors. And if you wish to have a further discussion with Dr. Erba, you can contact any one of us as well, and we'll connect you with Dr. Erba. All right, so thank you all. Thank you. Have a great evening. All right, okay.